I like it spooky. Hey everybody, welcome to I Like a Spooky Horror Podcast. I'm Brian. I'm Jason. I'm Clint, and if you are hearing our voices, it means two things. It means, first of all, that the boys, when they stayed at my house, did not screw up any of my collectibles. I did not murder them, and I did not go to jail. It also means, number two, that I did not fuck up this recording like I did when we were trying to do a bonus episode covering our time at Motor City Legacy. Well, with the whole artificial intelligence getting so big, maybe this really isn't Jason. Maybe this is AI and... Now I'm giving Clint too much, you know, credit there for him to understand AI and get that going. But someday we'll do an episode without us actually doing it. Just all artificial intelligence or non-intelligence. That whole spiel right there is about as wonky as the last episode where it opened up with Brian cosplaying as Chuck Norris. I know that AI is big in the news, but let's get to some horror news. I'm really excited about this story. As we're recording, the first record already came out for sale, but um, Waxwork and Rob Zombie are teaming up to come out with the Rob Zombie Presents series. So there's already a Rob Zombie Presents series, but I don't think anything's been released to vinyl yet. I know there's a, a Frankenstein CD and other horror soundtracks that haven't been released. He kind of put them out under his name. I'm sure he got rights to it, but so Waxwork started. They already put the first one out. The first one is White Zombie on a beautiful green and black marbled record. But I guess this is just the start of the whole series. The lineup is going to include titles as uh, Spider Baby, Carnival of Souls, The Last Man on Earth, The House on Haunted Hill, Island of Lost Souls, and of course, The White Zombie that just came out. So they're all going to be pressed on colored vinyl and housed in spe special packaging by new artwork illust er, and with new artwork by illustrator Graham Humphreys. So it's kind of tying everything I love. Rob Zombie and his amazing Halloween movies. <laughs> I, I, try to, I try to say it with that. <laughs> like, um, but no, really like waxwork records, you know, horror soundtracks. Graham Humphreys, he has some amazing art. So, I mean, it's just kind of tying it all together and putting it in a package like that screams, why am I so fucking poor? Because I'm totally buying into every single one of these. The last slim sliver demographic that we had left listening just left because you said that Rob Zombie's Halloween movies are awesome. <laughs> There's a couple people out there being like, yeah, like one or two, but. <laughs> I fell for uh, back on April Fool's Day, you know, about a month ago, and um, I fell for Rob Zombie was coming out with uh, the third Halloween movie, and I think I sent it to you guys. And then afterwards, I started seeing all these other weird movie type things, and then I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right, it's April Fool's." Okay. <laughs> no, I'm excited for this. I, I, it's, it's a pre-order though, so it kind of sucks. I think it's come, the first one's coming out in July. It's available right now as we record, but this won't, episode won't be out for a little bit. But being a pre-order, it really shouldn't sell out. Hopefully they print as many as they need. So, I don't know. Are you guys going to check it out? You know the cost on them, Jason? That's a good question. I think it was about 30-some bucks, like it usually is. I feel like that's something that I just need to jump on that with you. Order two and save on some shipping and just kind of... I mean, it almost seems like a no-brainer to get in early, get everything, because it's something that even if down the road, I'm like, I don't really want these. There's something that I can trade for something I want or sell and get something that I do want. You know, I mean, we're not sellers. I don't, none of us buy stuff to sell it. There is stuff that I'll grab and I'd be like, I want it now, but then you run out of room. You don't have enough space. So, and we've kind of all started doing that. Maybe not Clint, but. I'm just moving stuff around and putting it in a box. And if we do a convention or a toy show, I'm going to set it out on the table and hope it ends up in a good home of another collector. So this issue or this copy is 32 bucks. Waxwork is good with their 10% off coupon. So right around 30 bucks and then shipping. So if you spend over a hundred on Waxwork, it's free shipping, but I don't do that all the time. I've got a friend who's kicking around the idea of opening up his own horror themed Halloween store. 
that'll be something cool if we see it down the line. But this is something that uh, I could see in that store. It makes me think of when I went to Weirdsville Records and Jason, I, well, I told both you guys, but Jason was interested that I found some um, Bride of Frankenstein waxwork records. And you're like, which one? Is it the black? Is it this color, that color pressing or whatever? And I looked online and they were all gone. But Weirdsville Records has, you know, two, three, four, five copies. Yeah, this is this is cool stuff. And also, I'm glad because uh, when I first read this, I didn't read the article. I just saw the headline. And I thought it was just going to be Rob Zombie movies. And I thought to myself, well, there's already several Rob Zombie movie soundtracks out there. You know, uh, uh, what was the one with uh, where his wife was the she got possessed with the record? Was that Lords of Chaos? No, Lords of Salem. Lords of Salem. God, I can't believe complete brain fart anyway but i mean i've seen that and i've seen the monsters and stuff so no this is cool man because he's gonna go back and and uh, be a part of issuing some things from some movies long gone forgotten that this new generation might not have ever heard of and stuff that we don't see a whole lot of i will be listening backwards i'll be playing the records backwards <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about all that. But. Speaking of backwards records, I guess Trick or Treat. I'm jumping right in here. I'm sorry. Trick or Treat, you know, the movie from 1986 we covered a long time ago on the show here. I guess it's getting a 4K release, finally. That's pretty cool. It is from Synapse is doing it, but there's no release date as of yet. They're just letting us know. No, it's still hype. Coming, yeah. So, yep, I'm ready for it. They're really working on cleaning that scene up where he gets flushed down the toilet. <laughs> what you got brian so i know you guys don't care about this news but it's really exciting news at the godzilla household finn and i are already it's going to be something about godzilla godzilla alert godzilla alert <laughs> may 15th 2024 i'm not sure what day of week that is it might be a friday it's probably a friday godzilla I knew it. and kong the new empire so it looks like Godzilla, there's not, there's like a really short trailer out. No information on this. What I gather is Godzilla and Kong kind of came together last movie to fight <laughs> Mecha Godzilla. And there's a new villain, and it appears to be a, a giant ape, another Titan. He looks to have Godzilla's atomic breath power. You see in the trailer, his eyes are kind of like glowing, like Godzilla's spine glows when he blows the atomic breath out. We'll be in the theater to see it. I, I, it could be the weirdest, awfulest looking Godzilla, and we'd still go see it. No, that no, this this has big money written all over it. it, it it's gonna be great. You know, Godzilla versus Kong was a good movie, and it it looked beautiful. I'm excited. Yeah, it looks like they're going to go down in the, what did they call it, the Middle Earth some more and spend some more time down in there. And there's supposed to be a King Kong thing coming out on Netflix that deals with a lot of the Middle Earth stuff. I haven't seen anything about that lately, though. Are you excited, Clint? I'll be honest, no, but... For myself personally, I'm not I'm not excited. It's just not my thing. But I'm excited for you guys who are fans of that. It's it's phenomenal, you know. And I've also noticed um more buzz around that I don't want to say subgenre, but it's only the best word I can think of right now. Like where you're starting to see Days of the Dead book conventions that are specifically for that universe. Um so yeah, it's not my thing, but it's totally cool that it's uh still getting some love after all these years. I just tried to put that nice spin on it because I think Brian Clark might be in the show in the near future. And I don't want him to yell at me the whole time he's on here. So <laughs> He sent me a message the other day. He's like, what kind of movie should I pick? A Godzilla movie? A cryptid movie? A crazy like category three movie? I was like, I'm down for any of that. Same here. This is all about exposing other people and ourselves to stuff we haven't seen. What about you, Clint? What kind of news you got? Dude, there's again, there's so many news hits going on. I mean, I could talk about, uh, you know, the new season of American Horror Story that's going to have Emma Roberts and Kim Kardashian. I could talk about some Stranger Things uh, news. There's going to be an animated series coming to Netflix. There's like a prequel thing. Uh, let's see. Stranger Things Flight of Icarus season four prequel book. We'll talk more about Eddie. Uh, what else we got here? Mia Goth is going to be in the uh, upcoming mcu blade reboot these are some cool things so art the clown from terrifier apparently appears in a, a new pete davidson series and also i'm sure a lot of people listening have heard this but terrifier the original is heading back to the theaters soon so those are all little snippets but here is the article that i am settling on and it is called the visionary documentary you can find them on facebook here's a, a quick little read off here long before there was streaming of movies 
And well before there was Blockbuster Video, there was George Atkinson and the video station. He started it all. His life was a wild and crazy ride with gobs of money, gangsters, porn, celebs, and uh, beating the studios in court, going public, filing for insolvency. Uh, and this is an amazing story that needs to be told. So there is a Kickstarter right now for The Visionary documentary, which is covering the story of George Atkinson. Yeah, they launched a Kickstarter to help them uh, make the film, and you can check that out. I am have yet to do it. I'm going to. Uh, I kind of forgot about it, and then I came across this when I was looking through what news to cover today, and it reminded me I want to get in on this project because I think it's really cool. Yeah, I know you like your Kickstarters and joining in on that. Sounds interesting. You said documentary, right? It's going to be a documentary about about his life, basically the the pie, the pioneer and the boom of uh, the whole reason we're here talking because we were born and raised in the video store. Sounds exciting. I would check it out. Not sure if I'll contribute, but I'll look, see what kind of cool perks they have. Yeah, I haven't checked it out yet to see you know what the different uh, amounts are, what perks are available. So, and you're right, uh, not not even just Kickstarter, but I really love, and I did this when I owned my haunted house too. I love cross promoting with people all of us are just dreamers trying to get our projects off the ground and if we all support each other we can you know make some really cool things happen i don't have any money i'm broke <laughs> <laughs> i thought brian was gonna have something insightful there that's insightful yeah all right, sure <laughs> why are you broke jason <laughs> just trying to segue into that that i i missed that part it's been real fun sitting here being silent, watching you guys squirm, trying to figure out how to segue into the Why Are We Poor segment. I have a uh, a list of things going back to our time at Motor City Legacy up till now, why I'm poor. Let's talk about it. All right, so I kind of jumped on the bandwagon here hope i didn't mention this one already but i know the guys talked about uh the ren and stimpy record from enjoy the ride records Blamo. so i kind of drank the kool-aid too i got that in i ordered a copy of it and it actually goes back from when i was a teenager for so i loved ren and stimpy and i had either the cd or the cassette i don't remember which one it was and i listened to it a lot i loved shit like that that one's a one that kind of comes back and i think about that the simpsons sing the blues is also another thing back in the day that i loved the teenage mutant ninja turtle soundtracks when those movies came out i loved those so it's just it just kind of fits in so i i had to jump on i know that's not really horror related but we like enjoy the ride records and i like running stimping we've talked about it before so i kind of drank the kool-aid and i i got on that one too also, uh, Todd McFarlane and McFarlane Toys, they are re-releasing their Movie Maniacs line, which they started years and years ago with, you know, Freddy, Jason, Leatherface, Norman Bates, like all the classic actual Movie Maniacs. That's what started me into collecting right there. But now they rebranded it and it's not like so much Maniacs anymore. It's still called Movie Maniacs, but they have a new series now that include Ted Lasso. <laughs> which I like Ted Lasso. Um, Harry Potter has a toy, but one that kind of tied in with one of the greatest movies of all time, kind of horror. I picked up The Wicked Witch from McFarlane. It's, it's a beautiful presentation, and it's in a nice box, limited to 10,000 pieces, which 10,000 seems like a lot, but worldwide, it's kind of not. So I saw that up for pre-order on Target, and I ordered that like months ago and it finally came in and it's 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 beautiful um and that's one i will not open because it looks great just as it is in the presentation yeah yeah <laughs> and my whole family loves the wicked witch or loves the wizard of oz so i had to get that one and i kind of hope they continue with the other characters from the movie because i'll have i'll buy them all it, it is one of the greatest movies of all time and you know the witch ties into the horror stuff so It'd be cool to see if he follows up with with a, a darker version because we've got the uh, we talked about it a few episodes back, but the new Wizard of Oz coming out where it's uh, Dorothy's older now and it looks like it's supposed to be dark and creepy. It'd be sweet if maybe he did a line like that, kind of like he did uh, the Twisted Fairy Tales line or something. I remember I had some of those and got rid of them. I had Elizabeth Bathory, which was a cool one, and. <gasps> 
probably worth money now, but yeah, I don't have it anymore. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was still sealed too. I know. Is it is it worth a lot now? <laughs> oh, that noise was me breaking my pencil and getting pencil shavings in my eye. No, actually, I saw for a while there that they uh, the value seems to have dropped in them a little bit, and I can't think of a price off the top of my head. But they uh, they're more than what you paid for them originally. I've been wanting to pick up that whole series of Billy the Kid and Rasputin and her and uh, Vlad the Impaler and Genghis Khan. And I've had the opportunity to grab some. I just haven't done it yet. A couple more things. And now that I kind of wrote them down here that I didn't realize how related they are. My daughter and I went uh, shopping yesterday. We kind of my wife was at work. So we went down to the little coffee shop. We hit our local record stores. There's two of them. Ragged Records. There's one in Davenport, one in Rock Island. So we hit those. And I ended up finding, I'm a big fan of Ennio Morricone, who's the Italian composer who does tons of famous songs and movies like uh, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, A Fistful of Dollars, all that stuff. So I was in the record store and I found a vinyl collection called Ennio Morricone Collected. So it was like kind of his greatest hits. And the presentation was really nice. It was a uh, uh, Music on vinyl release, which I like them when they release stuff. So I picked that up. It seemed like it was a good price. I paid 30 bucks for it. I looked online. It goes about 40 some. I brought it home and listened to it right away. I love all types of music. That's a, so I put it on, listened to it. My daughter was like, I told her, I was like, okay, this isn't something I would typically listen to, but it's fun and I do enjoy it. It's kind of like a little guilty pleasure. So I listened to that last night and then I got to making my list. And I also, from Waxwork Records, bought the Thang soundtrack when they re-released it here a few weeks ago. They had two different copies. They had a Alien Blood one and a Broken Ice one or something like that, where it was like on a blue marbled vinyl with a breakaway box, like the outside box each side like comes apart and it looks like broken ice. So I saw that they were releasing it. It was a little bit more than I wanted to pay, but I'm like, oh, I've been wanting to this for so long. So I went ahead and I jumped on it right away. I bought it. And then like five minutes later, I was looking where people were complaining that it sold out. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm glad I jumped on it then. So, and of course that was, uh, Ennio did the thing soundtrack also. And it's a Carpenter movie, and that's one that he didn't compose himself. But that's what I got. It was a good mail day. All those. I love having them in my collection. I was going to say, back to your McFarland stuff. I wonder, you said the the Wizard of Oz, which is uh, limited to 10,000, I think you said. I wonder if they're going to do kind of what uh, <clears throat> what NECA does sometimes, where they, they throw something out and it's limited. And then it's almost like they're, okay, this sold out fast or whatever. And then they do a, a mass re-release. Well, they'll do also do like chase versions where they'll change like a little something on it and then re-release it. So it's a little different. Maybe so. I think it was still available in places if you look. So it hasn't sold out on Target. The pre-orders had sold out because I was thinking about buying the Ted Lasso one also. And then I got to thinking, I'm like, I really don't need that. <laughs> no, so I didn't order it. But I think I saw the Wicked Witch on other places, maybe Big Bad Toy Store or some of the other toy stores out there. Big Bad Toy Store. Hey, is that deal still going on with Attack of the... Wait, no. That's not Attack. It's not Attack of the Killer podcast. It was a Cracktastic Toy. I'm getting tongue-tied. Where you can uh, go through their affiliate link. Yeah, you go through their affiliate link and buy your stuff. And they... Jason and I have talked about them because we, we like them a lot because you order, you don't pay until the item ships. And they have like $4 shipping. You can bundle a lot of your stuff. You don't pay until it comes in, but then you pay for it, but then you don't have to pay shipping on it. They have like a little vault where they'll kind of hold it for you until until you get one or two or, you know, a couple items in. And then you could ship them all together for just a flat four bucks. So anything you buy on there, four dollar shipping, even if you buy the biggest thing, four bucks. That's where I bought my car, man. If you're listening and you're going to buy something from Big Bad Toy Store, then go through uh, the link with our friends there, Cracktastic Plastic and help them out as well. You're going to be buying this stuff anyway, so why not go through them? Oh, yeah. Ding. <laughs> Brian, what do you got going on? What, what, what? Why are you poor this week? We talked about Brian Clark already, so I'll start with that. Brian Clark has a new book out, so I picked it up. It's on Amazon. You can pick it up. He's got it in some local bookstores. Um, he lives in the Minneapolis area. It's called Putting the Ground to Sleep and Other Weird Tales. So I haven't popped it open yet because... 
I honestly don't really like to read, but when a friend puts out a book, I'm going to buy it and I'll, I'll look at it eventually. I mean, we went to the bookstore yesterday and I got my next thing was Scream Magazine. This is a horror magazine out of England. It's my favorite horror magazine. I've already looked at it because we were in the bookstore. It was independent bookstore day at the end of April. Tiffany ran into somebody she knew and was talking and talking and talking. And so I was like, there's a chair over here. I'm just going to sit in this chair and read my fucking magazine because we were in there for like, I went to get one thing and we were in there for like 45 minutes. So I've looked through the magazine already. I'll, you know, go back through. But what's this one? Oh, Jake, Halloween 2. Oh, shit. Brian Clark writes for Scream Magazine also, right? He does, yeah. Yep. And then my other thing, since Jason's talking about records, we got Graveyard Shift from Terror Vision. This is three ninety five out of 500 I haven't opened it yet, and it came with some... Uh, they've been doing this a lot lately, putting like some covers on them that they have an artist that they commissioned to do like a variant cover, and it just slides in there. And then this was one that went out on Record Store Day. This is my Terror Vision one, though. Hello, Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. And this is 198 of 500. Hell yeah. I remember um, watching that on, on USA Up all night. <laughs> and there's the variant cover for that one. I don't I haven't opened them yet. I, Weird. Yeah, I don't know. I'm torn. They're already kind of open because they open the back a little bit to write your serial number on them. So they're not like sealed all the way, but hey, the only thing that's going to be torn is the value of that when you tear into it and open it up. But you do what you want to do. You do what you want to do. But I'll, I'll share those on the YouTube channel. We've been doing a lot of shorts on the YouTube channel, so you can pop on and do. It's a minute long video. That's as long as it can be. So if you want to find some cool horror stuff or this or that, some verses, I've just been kind of having fun with it and. You could see a video of Finley coming to stab her parents dressed as Michael Myers from Halloween, Rob Zombie's Halloween. You could see Ted's gumball machines. I think my favorite, and it wasn't on the YouTube channel, but you were in a pink polo shirt standing next to this open grassy field, and you were smiling, and it said, I'm Brian Godsell from the I Like a Spooky podcast. I'm five, sta- five states away in Missouri, and I'm going to watch Joe Bob tonight. So I was almost going to be a dick. I was going to be a dick and I was going to take a picture of myself in like a suit and tie next to my grill and go, I'm Clint from the I Like a Spooky Horror Podcast. I'm getting ready to grill out some hamburgers. Make sure to watch a horror movie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still tired from that week. I can imagine. It's probably a long drive. What about you, Clint? What'd you get? I, I have so much stuff, but I'm like, I'm just going to do a couple things because if we shared everything that we'd got since Motor City and all that, I, we'd be here all week. Well, I'm going to go through everything I got from Motor City Legacy to now, but I'm going to go real quick. Yeah, so we were actually going to do a bonus episode on Motor City Legacy, a bonus Why Are We Poor episode talking about the great time that we had, the cool vendors uh, you know, that the boys got to meet, and a lot of the cool pickups, uh, but... I'll, I'll take the blame. I was uh, I was hosting that session and something screwed up. And so we weren't able to put out that episode. So I got a list. I'm going to go quick. Here we go. When the boys came up, Jason brought me uh, the Scream popcorn bucket that he bought me a while back. We've talked about before. Thank you very much. And let's see. Brian brought me the My Bloody Valentine cassette. That was cool. He also surprised me. I couldn't believe I couldn't figure it out until I opened it, but it was the Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things cassette. Both of those are from Terravision. Thank you for the gift. Uh, speaking of Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, when we were at Legacy, Brian Hoover was there, friend of ours, friend of the show, amazing traditional artist, um, you know, paintings and, and whatnot. And um, he had an Orville from Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things painting that I picked up from him that is proudly uh, staring at everybody from my wall now. Pretty cool stuff. Last episode... We interviewed Josh from Bootleg as Fuck Toys, and uh, while we were at Legacy, he was there also. He gave us all a, uh, a Silent Rage. I again, I'll, I'll call it toy. Um, what did he call it? A parody art? It wasn't no product art? Yeah, a toy that he made up from Silent Rage. I also uh, bought uh, his Miss toy, and then he had a My Bloody Valentine heart toy that we swapped out. We traded. He got my um, my Tromaville Atomic High joint toy. So while we were there, I got a. Uh, a free DVD from to- or director Tony Moran from Independent American Pictures from the Detroit area, uh, and he actually had worked with Josh. He had, did you guys see on his table? He had like the some toys there, it was like a chainsaw and some dog tags. Come to find out, he had worked with Josh. Uh, Josh was talking about that in the last episode, and so he directed a movie called Let Us In. Gave me a copy of that to watch, so I checked that out. Also, my friend Chris Krupe from Decompositions Corpse Creations. Come to find out, he did a movie. Back in, I think it was 2014, called Old Denton Road. 
from the Michigan area. So he gave me a copy of that. I was able to check that out. I love watching um, independent filmmakers, stuff like that, especially when they're in my backyard. It's it's a lot of fun. Got Jill Whitlow's signature on my Mike Mash shadow box while I was there. It was great meeting her. Uh, this was probably the coolest thing, though. So Psycho Goreman, we covered that a couple episodes ago. Mimi, the guy who played Goreman in the suit, and the director, Steve Kostansky, were there. I got all their signatures on the limited, sealed, Blu-ray with the battle-ravaged Psycho Goreman figure. And it was kind of a back and forth because we were all there, and everybody's like, how are you going to get it signed? Because it's sealed in plastic, the signatures are going to go there. So finally, I have these like uh, three-inch green dot stickers i use for inkmirrors.com to put the sizes of my shirts up and stuff and i was like oh i'll just put this on the box and have them sign that and that's what i did and it, it turned out really cool so i'm glad because that was limited to like 1500 pieces i think so i've got one of those signed by everybody and then towards the end of that show there was a comic-con exclusive red variant uh twilight zone sear box from that uh the shatner episode you know the old twilight zone back in the day and um i've been wanting that for a while uh, worked out a pretty good deal with those vendors. And, uh, you know, what's funny is, uh, you know, Ted, we were sitting next to Ted from Ted's Marvelous Custom Gumball Emporium. And he uh, he's not the most technologically savvy person in the world. And he was kind of having some issues with uh, with some things there. But then when I'm trying to figure out the value of this seer box from the Twilight Zone, he goes, oh, well, here it is. And he grabs his phone and he scans the barcode at the bottom. And he goes, well, I'll show you right there, like, how much it's sold for, what the asking price is, how many are available. And I'm just looking at him in amazement. I had no idea that even existed. I'm like, you can't figure out how to <laughs> turn your fucking phone on, but you can scan shit and scour eBay, weirdo. Uh, I've talked the past couple episodes about the car for the oldest. She is 16 now. She has her car. Thank God we are done with that. Lastly, this is the very last thing, the most current thing. And uh, Jason, I don't know if you hopped in this yet or not, but Fright Rags just released their 3.75 inch action figures. They had they had Dr. Loomis, they had Sheriff Brackett, and they had um, Annie from all from Halloween. I grabbed the uh, Sheriff Brackett and the Annie, and those are on their way. Nice, yeah. That's a lot. That's why I'm poor. So I was going to save that for a future episode, and like hopefully when they came in. Yeah, no, I I picked up all three. I have the original three that they put out, and then I jumped on it immediately yet or the other day when they went for sale and grabbed the other three. At 20 bucks a pop, it's hard not to pick them up. I didn't get Loomis, I didn't get Michael, and I didn't get Lori just because those are available in bigger, better quality action figures. I grabbed the ones that I did, including the PJ Souls one that we both have, just because there are no other action figures of those characters anywhere. I got to have them all, so I will have all six of them here. I want them all, I want them all, and I want them now. Yeah. And the Grammy goes to... Did anybody notice how awful the coat looks on Dr. Loomis? I didn't really pay attention to it. I just was like talking to some friends and Justin Beam chimes in. He's like, look at the coat on Dr. Loomis. So I go back and I look at it and I'm like, what the fuck? So at the last minute, they're like, we need a coat for Dr. Loomis. And, you know, some intern runs out and puts it it, and it looks like shit. I'm not knocking Fright Rags, you know what I mean? Um, because they put out some cool stuff and I have quite a few of their of th their offerings. But those figures are equivalent to like that Dollar Tree store little figure that you get for your kid because they're crying or, you know, you get for the birthday present for that kid in your family you really don't like. <laughs> the, I don't expect real detailed quality from those figures. Again, I just pick up the ones that there, there are no other figures of those characters. You kind of know what you're buying when you get those. But the card looks amazing. I'm like, the card looks great. I'm like, the artwork's great. The back looks great. And then the figure's like, meh. So, I mean, I guess you're 20 bucks for that card still seems like a good deal. I mean, for the artwork on that card. Of course you say that because you're big into slasher design. <laughs> oh, is that who? Oh, yeah, he did do the artwork. Art. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he did do those. They're, they are. They are gorgeous. Yeah. Yep. Well, all I know is, is, th is thanks to Brian. We're probably never going to get Fright Rags to be, you know, a sponsor of this episode now. Ruined let's, it. <laughs> let's let's see who we let's see who we can dig up for a sponsor for this episode. I like it spooky. Hey, everybody. 
Clint here from the I Like It Spooky podcast. If you have listened before, then you know this is when we showcase a commercial for the sponsor of an episode. We decided to take this spot today to let you know if you have interest in sponsoring an episode, all you have to do is send your name, business, and contact info to I Like It Spooky Pod at gmail.com. We will then get back to you with trade, rate, and fee info. And a contract written in blood. So this is a horror news reviews and entertainment show, but you do not have to be genre related to advertise to our audience. You could be looking to get the word out on an event. We're trying to reach the masses and let them know about casting calls for your next production. Hell, you could be wanting to fill a dispatch position at your local hospital. Maybe you own a coffee shop or want to let people know about your Indiegogo or Kickstarter campaign. Maybe you are the actress who played the waitress in Maximum Overdrive and you're looking for work. Hell, I don't know. Maybe you want to let the world know about your new escort service. Hey, Clint. Yeah, I don't think we can do that one. So remember, if you want to be a featured sponsor of one of the fastest growing podcasts around, send your info to I like it spooky pod at gmail.com. So now that we've heard from our sponsor, this episode we're discussing the 2023 horror, not comedy at all, soon to be a classic, Evil Dead Rise. What'd you guys think? You guys didn't get a good laugh out of it? There was zero comedy in that entire movie. So let's start from the very beginning. And actually, one of the one of the cool things right off the bat, and I don't know if it was like this where you guys were, was the Flash trailer. I'm not a superhero guy, DC, Marvel. I don't really get into that stuff. Um, but in the Flash trailer, did they show the trailer for the Flash where you guys were? Yep. yep. And we got to see that Michael, Michael Keaton was playing Batman. That was cool. I saw that trailer for uh, the Super Mario movie that trailer and everybody in the theater was like what because you know it's a bunch of four, 30 and 40 year olds watching Super mario brothers with their kids yeah people kind of freaked out when that came on i'm actually surprised with our like cancel culture wor- world right now that ezra miller can still be <laughs> in these huge box office movies but hey whatever i'll still i'll still check it out i'm now i'm not going to go to the theater for that but yeah it's worth a watch eventually just for the michael keaton batman like you said yeah, I'm excited to see him playing Batman, um, but I'm not going to watch it, period. I, I, just, I just know that I won't. <laughs> but it was cool to see that he's going to be Batman again. Yeah, it was kind of an odd group of trailers for the Evil Dead Rise. I was thinking there would be more horror movie stuff, but maybe there's not a lot coming out you know, in the next couple months. But it was superhero, superhero, because the Blue Beetle was one. Um, Transformers. What about Strays? Yeah, Strays, the, the dog movie. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> and then uh, the only horror one that I remember was The Blackening, which looks fun. I'll go see that one. Yeah, that looked funny. Uh-huh. They had the trailer for the, the Boogeyman on there, too, that's coming out. Oh, did they? They didn't have it where we I was, anyway, I mean, but... You're right, though. There's not a whole lot of new horror movies coming out in the next couple of months. I think a lot of the releases for new stuff in our genre is coming out later this year. So when the movie started, I thought we were like kind of coming out of the woods and going into the city and then i was you know the 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 cameras moving through the the forest and over the lake and stuff and i thought oh this is kind of neat it's like a visual transition of we're moving out of the away from the cabin into the city and then i was kind of it was kind of jarring when i realized oh now we got this whole setup at this cabin at the lake and i was a little confused at what was going on but it led to and i have 37 maybe 39 exclamation points after this in my notes one of the most amazing opening title sequences i have ever seen at the end of that yeah i guess we should do this this is a new episode or i mean this is a fairly new movie so spoiler alert we're going to be discussing things if you haven't seen evil dead rise yet you might not want to listen to the episode until after you see it unless you don't care about that stuff maybe you're valuing our expert opinion to see if it's worth going to see okay i'm just kidding we're not experts well maybe jason anyway um 
so yeah, at the end of the at the end of the opening scene, they're at you know the the cabin there, and there's what the the two girls and the guy, and the one girl winds up being possessed. She takes everybody out, rises up out of the lake, and then Evil Dead rise comes up behind the trees above her. It was stunning. It was beautiful. I need a giant poster of that. Yes. Oh, it'd be amazing. And the sound, they turned the sound up to twenty. Yeah. It was so freaking loud, man. You want to. Like a cinematic, though you want it long and wide, not up and yeah, not up and down. You want it long and wide, big old wide screen with so beautiful. They will probably come out with something like that. Um, and if they, meaning the the uh, the studios or whatever, the powers that be don't, I know some of these amazing artists that we know and always talk about will because there's there's a big buzz about this movie right now on the internet and just in general. And a lot of people are referring to that opening sequence, a lot of people. So we'll, we'll see something cool from it. And the whole scene leading up to it was pretty good. It wasn't bad. It was, I, again, I was confused, but it wasn't bad. Well, so it kind of leads right into the sequel right off the jump. Cause that happened after what happened at the high rise, which you don't know until the end. So again, I'm like, okay, we're going to the city. I'm like, wait a minute. We're still at the cabin. This, one girl's possessed. She kills the other two. Very cool cinematic rise. And then, boom, we just cut to the city. And I'm like, what in the fuck is going on? And then, so I have a love-hate relationship with this movie. So you're going to hear me say some really good things. You're going to hear me say some really bad things. Probably the first really bad thing is after the beginning sequence and they, we boom, cut to the city, jump cut to the city. It was slow, man. Everything leading up to the possession after that point was so monotonous. I know they were building characters and you were getting to know everybody, which is important but it was just slow and i'm like twiddling my thumbs like what the fuck is going on what the fuck is going on yeah they they had to set up the characters kind of make you fall in love with some of the people i thought the group of kids was kind of annoying as shit like if those were my kids i'd be, I'd be getting handing out ass whoopings all around like the kid playing his music super loud the little girl was cute she was kind of you know creating she's a future designer of horror props and stuff look i know this is utterly retarded but when you first get into their apartment and they're panning and there's like toys all over the floor i saw the maximus horse toy from tangled and i know because i had and played with that toy a lot when my <laughs> oldest was younger maximus from tangled is in evil dead rise <laughs> we still have that toy several of them actually yeah do you let finley play with them what the maximus <laughs> yeah sure it is the horse is the best part of the movie, just so you know. It started really fast, and then, like I said, it kind of muddled up. And you're like, okay, what, what are we doing? Where are we going with this? I kind of feel like you don't need that in these movies. I mean, when you get to a certain point in a series, do you need character development? Um, I went with somebody that had never seen an Evil Dead movie. It's Jack's buddy, Xavier. He's helping me mow this year. So I said, I I go to the movie alone. If you want to go with me, you're more than welcome to. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll go. Uh, he's like, I've never seen any of the Evil Dead movies. Do I need to? And I was like, I don't think so. I mean, they're pretty cut and dry. Somebody gets possessed. They fuck start killing everybody. That's the, I mean, what? that's it. There's a book. The chaos in Evil Dead and the whimsical way it's always been presented is the character. This movie and the 2013 remake from Fetty Alvarez did more of the let's get to know the characters involved in their backstories, which I got no problem with. I just felt that in Evil Dead Rise, it was beat to death a little bit. It was just it kind of, you know, OK, yeah, I get dad's gone. I get their their sisters. I get that she's a band technician. You know, I get all this stuff. But I mean, so after we kind of get over that speed bump. I really did like the way that the book was revealed. I mean, they are in California and there was an earthquake. It made sense. And then it revealed this hole in the parking garage structure where they found this like old bank vault and stuff down there. And the kids go down and that's where they discover a lot of cool, crazy stuff. And that was fun. It had this like little Goonies vibe to it. Um, that was exciting. I felt like I was a kid exploring this cool thing and finding some stuff. And that was fun. I do absolutely love that they pulled the church and religion into this because that is one of the few things that to this day like the exorcist and the i'm not a religious person but the whole that's always been kind of that bothers me kind of thing scares me kind of thing is when there's religion tied into a story or a movie they did a great job with that as far as i'm concerned and some more information about the book there's three copies of this book because this is not the one that's in 
any of the original Evil Dead. So this looks different. So you would think if that was that book, they'd make it look like that. This is a different book, I gather. So that book's still somewhere else, you know, back in the Middle Ages or it's, you know, in Tennessee in a cabin or, you know, somewhere else. So I liked some of that stuff with it. And uh, one of the things that I had told Xavier was he's like, who's the main character in this movie? And I said, you know, it's funny. Bruce Campbell's always been the main Evil Dead person, but we're almost getting to the point where the book is the main character. The Necronomicon is the main character in this series. Because you can go back and you can, you know, watch the first two and then Army of Darkness, and then you can go watch the 2013 and this one, and then they did the Creep Show episode. The one thing that's in all of those, all of them, is the Necronomicon. Yeah, that's the constant. No, I agree with you that um, throughout the whole series, I think the one part of this that was missing, I guess, or, or not involved was the church. And you kind of think that with Ultimate Evil and that the church would be involved. So yeah, I did love how this movie, it uh, it expanded on the mythology of the book. I loved the whole three books thing. I, I don't know if this is like a theory, but a lot of people are saying, you know, so okay, there's this is the third book then. The first one is Ash and, and Evil Dead. The second one is in the 2013 remake. And this is the third one myself. I still like to believe and pretend that 2013 isn't a remake or another book. It's a continuation from the original evil dead series. That's just the fantasy world. I like to live in. So in my mind, that is still the same book. We just saw part two in evil dead or the second book in evil dead rise. And there's still a third floating around, but not only did they like expand on the mythology of it, which I thought was great. I loved the fucking book design. I loved how it had like the teeth, hanging off the side to close it and it sucked up the blood and it opened up and I love the sound it made. That the whole thing was great. Yeah, that's how they set it up though. They had to put the sharp teeth on there to make the blood get on the book to really open it up, get going. I don't know. I didn't like the whole part with the earthquake though and the ground opening up all of a sudden right down to this tomb where all the coins are hanging and stuff and the tomb happens to break open and that's right where the kid goes. And somebody made a comment online that the record said 1923, but we records weren't created until like 1937 or something. I don't know if that's true or like what the history is, but that's something I should have looked into a little bit more before. You're the vinyl guy. You you don't know that? I should. No, no. It's... So that that's the first I've heard of that theory. And I guess the first thing that popped in my mind is when things like that come up, like right there, I'm going to say, well, it was the church. Maybe they had access to technology that the masses didn't yet or something i swear that records were around before then 1857 maybe they didn't look like that record because that's a more of a current looking record i was one of those people that just read something online and believed it <laughs> that, that i always warn everybody about yep nope i fell for it but <laughs> but yeah that whole part though where he just happens to find it but i like that's I love the way they do that because in the original Evil Dead, they had the recording on tape on like the reel to reel type setup. And now, of course, this one dates it. So it's back on records. Well, and what I thought was cool, too, was is it dates it because they're recorded way back then when the only means of recording was to record on vinyl. But it's also kind of timely because currently we talk about it on the show all the time. We are in a vinyl resurgence. So I thought it was cool that they were these recordings for out of records. It just you know gave it a cool feeling. And it kind of sets it up because the kid is in his room playing records, like acting like a little DJ. So it would have been better if it was on a cassette and he would have been like, what the fuck is this? I always hate when people are like, oh, that wouldn't happen and that wouldn't happen and that wouldn't happen. And it's like, go back to the worst fucking day of your life. And how many things that day happened that you're like, that'll never fucking happen again. What are the odds that any of that stuff would happen? And it all happened on the worst day of your life or the best day. I mean, how many times have you been like, oh, I went to this show and I did this and I ran into this celebrity and they gave me an autograph and they took a picture. And they, you know what I mean? Like, you don't ever think any of that's going to happen. And it happens to you. But when it's in a movie, you're like, oh, that would never happen. That There would never be an earthquake in Los Angeles. Really? Never? I've never resurrected a demon, though. That that I know of. This one time I was having a really shitty day. And I was on the phone venting about my shitty day. And as I'm on the phone venting about my really shitty day, a bird shit on me. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True story. True story. So again, again, I thought it was kind of great because again, you, you think of earthquakes. I think, I think of California. Now, if like a tornado brought the book in and it dropped on the ground or something, I'd be like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> to me, it, it it made sense. You know, it made sense. Um, 
But getting back to the records, so when he starts playing the record, the brother starts playing the record. My oldest was like, there's the cameo, I hear Bruce. I didn't hear it at the time. I was more focused on the visuals because I swear that, because as he's playing the record, he's kind of flipping through the book and it was real quick cuts, but I swear that I saw a sketch of Bruce as one of the priests. And I also swear that I saw a sketch of Henrietta from Evil Dead 2 as like one of the demons floating around. But I've seen other people say, yeah, that was his cameo, was that he was one of the priests on the record. Kind of like when the chaos broke out, oh, what do we do? And he was like screaming in the background or something. Yeah, they had showed a picture of the priest, but I didn't really pay much attention to who they were. So that would be interesting to go back and see if, you know, when we rewatch this, if it's him and it was one of the priests. It was a real quick, you know, black and white flash into the picture of the priest. Damn it, now I got to watch it again. Oh, I'm excited to watch it again. Yeah, even though I have a love-hate relationship with this, I, I will watch it again. It, it was enjoyable, and there are a lot of a lot of Easter eggs that when you're in the theater. Oh, and it was sucked as when we went to see it in the theater. It was a pretty packed theater, and so we were sitting like one row back from the front of the screen. So we're just our necks are back trying. It's really hard to see everything that's going on. And one one thing I was going to talk about in a little bit that I didn't care for about this movie is it had that shake. It was dark. And it had that shaky cam action shit, which I loathe. I loathe. And so between sitting where I was and those elements, it was really hard to catch a lot of the little things in there. So we uh, went, I went last night before we record the night before we record, we went about 720 on a Saturday and it was still about 40% full in the theater, which made me happy. And people were quiet. No one was like on their phones. There was people talking, you know, kind of through the movie. Nothing loud, though, or being obnoxious, but, you know, kind of talking about things that were going on in the movie. But it made me happy that still this couple weeks out, it's still doing well. And there's still people going to see it. And there was some kids there. And I was like, man, this might be a little too young for these kids. But I'm like, eh, whatever. I mean. I, we had fun. I mean, we had a good time going to the movies, and I I kind of think this is a thing that all of us enjoy. I love going to the movies. I absolutely love going to the movies, sitting in the dark, seeing the trailers, getting soda and popcorn, and just taking in a movie with a group of people, or even if it's by myself. It's just an experience that I treasure. I was talking during the movie. I looked over at my girls and I was like, look, there's Michael Keaton as Batman. And they're like, huh? Who? And I was like, that guy right there. And they're like, what? And I said, he played Beetlejuice. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> the brother plays the records. He's flipping through the book. The demons are released. The mom has left the apartment. She's in the elevator going to like do laundry, I think, on another floor or something. The demon comes right at her. And I thought that was kind of cool. I mean, um, it looked like this may be me always looking weird deep into shit, but it looked like it was trying to test her. It was just kind of fucking with her for a minute. And it was almost like I viewed it as the demon was like, OK, is this person easy to enter? Is this person hard to enter? Do they have a strong will? You know what I mean? They always talk about the weak and the weary are the ones we possess type stuff. And I was just kind of dicking with her for a little bit. And then it finally is like, OK, and entered her and the elevator all tore up and she was hung up in all the elevator cables which I thought was reminiscent of the tree vines from the originals. She goes back to the apartment after that. And what's she cooking eggs? I'm like, God, I don't want to have breakfast tomorrow. Can we have just like <laughs> sausage instead? I don't need any eggs for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> and of course, today we're going through our eggs because we got some farm fresh eggs. And I was like, yeah, can we have eggs next weekend? <laughs> Tiffany's like, this is probably a double yolk. And I'm thinking it's probably got like a fucking yolk and a blood in it or some shit. I don't want eggs this morning. <laughs> She'll shred you some fresh cheese with that cheese grater. Come on. Fresh shredded cheese. Ooh. So it makes me wonder, like, if she wasn't going down the elevator right then, what the fuck would the demon do? Would it just enter the elevator and choose a random floor? Or what's it going to do? It would have found somebody. Yeah. You just see all the, button, all the buttons light up. <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. 20 minutes straight of the demon flying around and not finding anybody. <laughs> Knocking on the door. This apartment's empty. This apartment's empty. I'm glad that it did find the mom because uh, Alyssa Sutherland's portrayal as the possessed mom was, it was freaking phenomenal. Yeah, it was. Uh, I love the way she delivered her lines once possessed. It was the opposite. The way all the lines, she delivered the lines. In the, in the, the past entries in the franchise, when someone's possessed, it's just kind of like this upbeat, chaotic, whimsical ah, type delivery. And hers were very 
downbeat, like, oh, mommy's with the maggots now. And, and all of her lines were delivered down like that. And it made him just really, really creepy and almost like condescending and smir- like snarky. I loved, I loved her portrayal as the possessed mom. She becomes possessed. She goes to make the eggs. She vomits an ungodly amount of whatever that <laughs> substance is. Do you think that's like their soul clan or Jason? Do you feel like that's like their humanity leaving their body? Because it's like they're on that edge where they're all okay, but they're still possessed. And then they vomit this white chunky substance out and then they kind of pass. Kind of like when a woman's water breaks during pregnancy, something is being, something is being born. That's when their soul leaves their body. When they have kids. Uh, yeah, we're parents. We know. <laughs> yeah, they're parents. They lose their soul. And uh, <laughs> then she dies. The neighbors come, and the one kid's like, can we pray? And the sister's like, well, she wasn't really religious. And I wanted him to say so bad, well, I fucking am. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I need to pray. Because he closes her eyes, and they open back up. That I was like, oh, shit. She dies. And, you know, the kids are mourning, and then... uh. She comes back to life. She like sits up. Of all the things besides the eggs, maybe the fly landing on her eye. I was like, oh shit, her fly landed on her eye. That was probably the thing that made me gross out the most out of the whole movie. She comes back to life and they give her a bath because she's hot. That was a cool scene, of course. But I mean, of course, they showed it on the trailer. I think the trailer showed a little too much. It kind of showed some of the, I think if they wouldn't have shown like the bath scene or something, how cool would that have been to see in real life or rising out of the lake? Most of the special effects were great. When the sister is sitting in the chair and she's, you know, past the rain in the background in the window. I looked at Xavier and I was like, look how fucking bad that rain looks in the background. He's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> like the rain looked awful. It looked like shiny little pieces of snow almost falling in the background. I was like, I guess if that's my biggest complaint about the special effects, <laughs> but I was like, couldn't they just fucking cut, shut the curtain or something? All this money and they have shitty looking rain in the background. <laughs> That is the most critical thing I've ever heard. Anyway, this movie was great, but that fucking rain on the windowsill behind the plant in the back with the half a light on it, that was the dumbest <laughs> fucking thing I've ever seen. That's crazy, dude. You went you went deep. Well, you were talking a minute ago about the, the neighbor wanting to, to pray. Other than, you know, getting killed and making sense because it was an apartment building, so it made sense there was other people there. I thought all those other characters... They were just unnecessary. They were just there to be there. Although I say other than for getting killed, because actually one of my favorite, besides the title sequence, one of my favorite sequences in this film is when the possessed mom kills everybody in the hallway through the people. And you just watch all the action through the people. And she just you just see them running off screen, running on screen, getting slammed against the wall. That was a great, great sequence. That poor little kid gets his arms ripped off. Right. And it had another another throwback because again there was a lot of throwbacks, a lot of nods, a lot of Easter eggs to the originals. But in that in that sequence, then we kind of get out into the hallway for a minute, and we got the uh, the popped out eyeball flying across, and then the one kid chokes on the eyeball, just like what happened in <laughs> Evil Dead Two. I thought that was that was pretty cool. I knew when the old man was talking, he was like, "Oh, let me go get my shotgun." I'm like, "Oh, here we go, introducing the shotgun into it," because he was going to shoot the lock off the door. One of the other throwbacks to the uh, originals. Why do you, well, I don't understand why when I say something, you guys laugh. Did I miss something? No, just the just the weird silence. Like it looked like you were trying to process what I was saying. Oh, I was, and I was like, I can't do anything with that. So let's move on to this. <laughs> it happens a lot, and I'm like, what's going? Did I? Is there a fucking booger hanging from my nose? Did I miss something? I like I start to talk, and Jason just looks at me and laughs, and I'm like, what's going on? So another throwback to the originals that I actually absolutely hated this was uh, we're skipping around some of the action, but now everybody that was killed in the hallway is they're all possessed demons and they all start screaming the dead by dawn over and over and over. And I, I I can't tell you why I just hated it. And it was just flat. I thought it was just, I thought it was tacky. I thought it was stupid. It was the evil dies tonight moment for this movie. Yes, exactly. Before everybody comes back to life that's in the hallway, that was kind of odd, too. They just kind of stayed dead for a long time. There was no transition to being demons for quite a bit of time. Um, And in between, the daughter becomes possessed. She kind of transitions. The son, at one point, transitions. So all that's left is the sister, who, for some reason, is pregnant. I don't know why she needs to be pregnant. 
I mean, it didn't really fit into the story. It's fine. It's whatever. And the youngest daughter is all that's left. And they're fighting this horde of possessed demons to try to survive. Yeah, when the daughter gets possessed and she's standing in the kitchen like up on the counter like that and that person, somebody walks in, I would have been like Janine on Ghostbusters. I would have stopped right there. I'd be like, oh, we got another one. <laughs> like It's like, and I'm not going to be like, hey, are you okay? <laughs> no, you see what the fuck's going on in your house. She's not okay. If you have all of this shit going on, why are you going to listen to this record and sound canceling headphones with not one on and one off so you can kind of hear what the fuck's going on and still listen? Some of it didn't make sense, but... And they had to foreshadow that, though, because the guy was talking about the cat being in the air ducts. So it kind of told you like, oh, OK, well, that's how people are going to get around in this movie. That was a cool scene, though, like when she was listening to the, the soundproof headphones and then the sister or the mom pops up behind her. It's pretty cool. last scene. That's all I had to say about that. Sound like Forrest Gump. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about the sister being possessed again. I, I don't think that the possessed mom's sister there was no purpose for her being pregnant either other than for the cool line that the the younger sister when she got possessed and she's like i'm eating the glass and she's like i'm trying to get rid of the creepy crawlies in my stomach i don't like the creepy crawlies in my stomach and had that same delivery that the mom did again very creepy downbeat line delivery and then looked at her and she was like you probably don't like creepy or crawly things in your stomach either and it, i don't know it was just all weird creepy but when the possessed sister she reminded me of johnny bartlett from fright uh the frighteners when she had the blanket over her and she went to lunge it looked just like johnny bartlett with the carpet over him and then right when that happened she looked like the, she was kind of standing there and she looked like a ghost and boots and i turned and looked at each other and we were like Ooh, we started laughing we both had the same <laughs> thought at the same time and then um <laughs> as we were discussing the movie afterwards on the ride home boots is like i so wish that that sister would have taken the scissors and just like cut holes in it like Charlie Brown. <laughs> that would have been so cool. <laughs> I had a little trouble with scissors. And so in that scene, though, Hannah, uh, the oldest, she cringed when uh, the possessed sister was eating the glass and you're seeing the glass go down her throat. And then Boots, uh, when the scissors went up the mom's nose, she was like, I wanted to sneeze so bad when I saw that. <laughs> it was kind of neat getting the feedback from them, but it, I also, okay, this movie is making two completely different people physically react to the action that's going on. So even though if you love this movie, hate this movie, whatever it, uh, it did well in making people feel uncomfortable in certain scenes. Yeah. I kind of felt like this was the area of the movie. Like what? What are you laughing about? <laughs> this was the area. Like you had an issue with the beginning where it kind of was building the characters. I had an issue in the, it towards the end or in this middle part, this would be like act two towards the end of it, where I just felt like something needed to happen. Like, it just became a gross gore fest of just over and over. And what is the grossest thing, the most blood, the most we can put on this screen? And it just kind of muddled it down for me in the middle. And I'm just like, okay, I'm ready for him to go to the next place. And I'd kind of known what the next place was because I, you know, somebody spoiled it online. I saw people questioning things that were coming later in the movie. And I'm just like, okay, let's go. Cut out like 10 minutes in the middle here. I, I got it. These kids are all turned. The people outside are all turned. Everything's, you know, we're going to the next spot. No, but when they all like morphed together into that creature... Well, that was, yeah, that would be the start of the third act, kind of going out of the apartment into the hall to go down to the basement. I came across this uh, this post from Chris Alexander, who is the uh, the former editor-in-chief of Fangoria, guy up in Canada. He's pretty involved in, in the horror industry. I was going to share it later, but Brian, it ties in with what you just said. It says, uh, Evil Dead Rise was suitably vile and pervertedly gory but left no lasting mark on me. He said he's already forgetting it. Um, not sophisticated enough in its Freudian, Freudian subtext to affect me psych uh, psychologically and the grand splatter that I've seen before so many times. Gore alone just isn't dangerous anymore. You know, he goes on to say that all he found it was far more unpleasant and depressing than fun, which is what an Evil Dead movie should be, is fun. But it's still exceedingly well made with some truly revolting and grim moments. It just made me think of what you just said, that it tried to ride the, the gore wave. And that's where I think one of the reasons it fell flat. It didn't have that 
that whimsy of other entries in the franchise. When you think Evil Dead, you think fun. Yeah, you think gory, but you think fun also, and it, it just wasn't. I did not dislike this movie. I enjoyed it. I'll watch it again. But um, like you said, it's when you see Evil Dead, you go Evil Dead, you go Evil Dead 2, you go Army of Darkness, um, the Ash vs. Evil Dead series, the Creep Show episode. Outside of the 2013, there's always been that physical comedy, slapstick, fun in Evil Dead. This was a complete departure from that, which is fine. I don't feel like I need just straight blood and guts. And it's something we had talked about before with maybe Terrifier 2. It was just maybe a little too long, a little too much story. Gore for the sake of gore. Yeah, just that's just it. I want more. I want more of the history of the book. Put more of that in there. I'm all about that. I mean, make me a movie that has the gore. But give me the history of the book and tie the book more into it. Because I feel like after she gets possessed, other than some pages turning every so often, you forget the book's even part of this movie. It's something I'll watch again. It's, I don't even remember how long it was, hour and 30 minutes or so. I don't know. Was it, I don't seem, it doesn't seem like it was overly long, but it's something I will throw on and maybe have on in the background and not have to pay that much attention to because there was not a lot of story outside of that little bit of the book. I, for one, loved the gore. I got excited when I saw the tree chipper <laughs> in the garage. No, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't dislike the gore. I mean, we're all gore whores here. It was just that I, I think it was just relied upon too heavily as, as a character in the, the story. No, you're talking about the wood chipper. The one thing I did like about this film was it had a lot of, I always like movies that have the throughouts. You know, that's what I call them, like a lot of setups. This had like the parking garage gate. You saw that it was faulty. And I'm like, okay, something's going to happen with that. The wood chipper right in the beginning. I'm like, okay, that's going to come into play. The scissors, the Staffney doll spear that was being made. This is going to protect me against the bad things before there were even bad things around. You know, so I love when they do that. But Jason, you uh, you just talked about when all the, the demons towards the end, the aunt and the, the youngest sister are trying to escape. Everybody's possessed and mutilated and all fucked up now. And they all start converging on each other all the demons and i could not figure out what the hell was going on i was like are they it was almost like sucking on mom's tit like what are they doing are they eating her and i didn't realize what was happening until they intercut it with uh the the pages of the book flying open and then it stops on this like monster with all these arms and faces and i was like oh it's kind of like transformers like all the constructed cons are like forming the giant robot right now they're all All these demons are mashing into one. It looked really cool. I loved the gore of it. From like a tactical standpoint, I'm like, why are the demons putting themselves together in this ball of thing that now it's harder to move around and they can't attack from all angles? So, and it reminded me of uh, the end of uh, Society. You guys have seen that film Society from like 88 where everybody kind of merges together and this like, oh, you should watch that flick. It's, It's pretty cool. Nothing to do with Evil Dead, but... This scene, it was almost like a nod to that. These weird monsters all merge together in this like orgy. It's it's weird, but um, <laughs> you have to watch Society just so you can see the guy that merges with the guy's face to his ass. So it's like an ass face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when they were when they were all merged together, I debated with the girls, and I still don't know. And this is one of the reasons I got to go back and watch it. Once the the demons kind of merged together, they like shot up the um, elevator shaft. And I could swear that there were still some other demons in the hallway. The girls were like, no, they all merged together. And I'm like, I don't know. I was like, I'm pretty sure there were still some in the hallway when that thing shot up. If if I'm right and there were some in the hallway, then what the hell at the end of this movie happened to those four or five or six demons that were still in that building? Well, is it multiple demons or is it just one? I always just took it that it was just the one possessing and I felt like it needed to be in, in human form to do something to other people, I guess. Well, I guess, no, they could have just... I always took it as multiple because they always say, like in uh, Evil Dead 2, they're like, we have one. They, they use the word we a lot and, and refer to Legion and stuff. So I always thought it was more than one. Reminded me of that movie uh, Slither, how it just becomes this big chunk of flesh. Um, was just the mom and the two children. The other demons were still in the hallway. But I don't know how the Evil Dead universe works. If you kill the original possessed, is it kind of like a vampire? If you kill the vampire that bit this person, that bit this person? Look at Evil Look at Evil Dead from 1981. Cheryl was the first person possessed, Ash's sister. Wait, did she did get killed, didn't she? Yeah, she got killed. And wait, oh God, I got to go back and watch that now. No, I don't think so. I don't think it's like vampire where you kill the one demon and the rest die. I'm pretty sure they're, they're multiple. 
they're in the elevator shaft. They get down to the parking garage. And I swear to God, I saw the Delta sitting in the parking garage. That's another thing I got to go back and watch. It was a quick <laughs> shot. They were like panning. And I'm like, that's the Delta. I, oh, I can't tell if it is. But then the, uh, you know, of course, the fight ensues between the weird demon blob monster, the aunt and the younger sister culminates with a chainsaw popping out of the wood chipper, which ends in the blob monster being pushed into the wood chipper. And this is by far the thing I hated about this movie the most. I fucking hated, 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 hated. When the ant has the chainsaw, revs it up and said, come get some. I'm like, no, no, cheesy, stupid. That's Ash's line. Stop. (laughs) Just stop. Well, you've never been attacked by a demon. Maybe it does something to you where. You just start randomly (laughs) quoting Ash. That's a other movie. Yeah. Uh, I liked it. It was was a good movie. I can't wait to watch it again. I got a question. What's that? Why the fuck does Jason laugh every time I talk? That's my question, but I guess I'm one funny guy. I'm here. I'm I'm a clown. I'm here to fucking amuse you. Tell me how fucking funny I am. (laughs) Anyway, my question is, is if the priests from the recording failed, right? As they, obviously you heard on the record, we failed. Who vaulted everything up? Is there like a, a Vatican SWAT team? Who came in and cleaned up the mess? He had talked about on the record other priests coming to help him. Um, and he had went to the church and asked to be able to um, translate the book. And the church is like, absolutely not. Maybe they didn't say it like that. They probably said, oh, no, Father, don't do that. It's, you know, it's not in your best you know interest. But uh, I would imagine the church came in and sent people in to clean it up and vault it up and put up the, all the crosses and trinkets and Jesus on the cross so it could fall and scare that kid. So I guess that's if this is a sequel, though, I guess it's not a sequel. It's just a whole another movie then that was locked up since the 20s. How did it happen in the 80s? But I guess it was a different book like we talked about. I thought I saw something where there were like several different books, like with different names. But I don't know the whole history about it. The director of this film said that they've got I it was like four, I think maybe maybe five, four or five other Evil Dead movies they want to make based off which again, I I liked this, the expanding on the mythology of the books, but then turned around and said, there's three books and this is the third one. And I'm like, why paint yourself into a corner right off the bat? Why, why are there three? Why aren't they 15? Why aren't there six? Why aren't, you know what I mean? Why, why even say how many there are? Just, just let it continue to go until everybody's sick and tired of it. Because then of course this movie ended how it began, which I always enjoy the little, you know, how they do that. But I I thought it was kind of dumb And uh, I was glad to see it because it made sense to what we saw in the beginning, which I had already forgotten about at this point in the movie. There was the lady who wound up being possessed in the beginning of the movie at the cabin, lived in that apartment, apparently didn't hear all this shit going on throughout the night. And then was walking to her car on her phone. I'm going to go to the cabin for the weekend. You should come with me. And then she gets possessed. And then, of course, we go to the cabin. So the the ending, I thought, was kind of sloppy and some loose ends that didn't didn't quite make sense. Yeah, Xavier's like, that lady lives in the building and didn't hear any of that. And I was like, well, they were on the 14th floor and she's on the fifth floor. So that's kind of a couple floors away. But I said, he's like, well, yeah, but wouldn't you hear a shotgun going off? And I was like, I mean, it's L.A. Maybe that happens all the time. You're just like, oh, gunshots. (laughs) (laughs) It was it was a bad part of town. Of course, you know, the mom didn't care about sending the the teenage kids out in her car to grab pizza. So maybe it wasn't that bad of a area of town. Who knows? That was the thing I disliked the least about the movie that they dropped the pizza because I was fucking hungry. I was like, man, I could really go for some pizza. And then they left it. I'm like, it just got dropped in the box. Fucking put it back. Take it back upstairs. What the hell? God made dirt. Dirt won't hurt. No, it didn't even come out of the box. So you guys want to rate this? Let everybody know what we really think. Heck yeah. Am I going to go first? I always go first. You always go first. You guys can kind of shit on me. Yeah, pretty much. I'm torn. I don't know which way to go. I've got two numbers in my head. Six seems a little too weak. Seven seems right. I'm going to go with seven. Seven demon arms coming out of a blob out of ten. I enjoyed the movie. The whole ride. I loved it. You guys talk about the downtime. I didn't see it that much. I enjoyed it from start to finish. I'm excited to see it again. I'm excited to buy it when it comes out. Hopefully it comes out to streaming first so I can watch it again. I was super close to telling you, Brian, yesterday, like, hey, I'm going to come on down to meet you. And I just to, I want to I want to see it again, you know, but didn't I want to see it again. It, it was it was a fun ride. I don't I didn't take things too seriously. I was just kind of in for the fun of it, for the gore, for 
a good story for the cringy moments. We didn't even talk about the cheese grater, which, of course, they showed that another thing on the trailer, which they should have saved. It was kind of lame. Just kind of rubbed it on the skin and it was kind of over. Just messed up the skin. I would have loved to have like. Yeah, it was overhyped. Overhyped for sure. I would have loved to have seen like skin spaghetti coming out of it or something like just something (laughs) gross like that. But I enjoyed the movie. I really liked it. I thought they did a fantastic job with it. It does have its moments, though, that are like, okay, uh, that's that's silly. But, you know, props to everybody involved in that. I didn't know who Bruce Campbell was in the movie. And it was cool to find out he was one of those, the priests. And I thought it was the main priest talking at first. And I saw somebody else talking about it, that it was the one that screamed something out. Like, great movie. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad we covered it. It lived up to the hype that I had built up in my mind for it. Now, what did Tanya rate it? You told me she rated it, too. I think she told me right after the movie, she's like, yeah, that was a 10. I, you know, she's easier with the things, but it, it was... it. it very good movie but now that i have time to sit and think about it i can't just go with a straight 10 but it was a great movie i recommend anybody going and seeing it i even called some of my co-workers like the following after i went and saw it i'm like hey did you go see this go check it out it was really good yeah I, i'm i'm there with you i gave it seven staffanies out of 10 <laughs> that was my favorite part of the movie Stephanie, this is Stephanie. That was one of the things we didn't talk about either. That was when the girl runs into the thing and it goes in her through her and she pulls it out real slow. But uh, yeah, I I had fun with it. It's not my favorite Evil Dead in the series. I love Army of Darkness. I will always love Army of Darkness. It's my favorite. It's cheesy. It's, you know, you know, Army of Darkness. I mean, but uh, yeah, I gave it seven out of ten. I had fun going to see it. I'll watch it again. No one else in my house will watch it because Tiffany's like, no, it looks too bloody. It's too much gore for Finley. You know, Jack may watch it, but it's one of those I'll put on again some night when I maybe have to edit or, you know, I'm like, eh, nothing looks good. I'll watch it again and probably go through and try to pick up more of the Easter eggs. That would be a fun thing to do. What about you, Clint? What'd you think? I think I'm getting ready to shit all over Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm not mad that I went. People are like, hey, what do you, you think? What would you think? And I said, I'm not mad that I paid to go see this. I did not leave the theater in disgust. But with that said, um, I thought it was too dark. I thought it was too depressing. It was too flat. It lacked that that whimsical slapstick humor, charm, that fun that I expect from an Evil Dead entry. It just it fell flat. And it had nothing to do with the fact that Bruce wasn't in there. Sorry, Bruce Campbell. But again, like when uh, when Creepshow did the, the Evil Dead episode, he wasn't in it. And I enjoyed the shit. I liked that episode more than I liked this movie because it had what I am drawn to that for, the slapstick, whimsical, but yet serious, dark, gory tone. But this this was just it didn't have that. It was just one dimensional, I thought. Um, and I hate I hate the shaky camera work. I cannot stand when you get into that whole shaky camera action work. It's like, you know what? Establish, frame some shots and show what you're trying to show. I, I, I am not a professional filmmaker, but I feel that that's cheating. So a lot of people are referring this to the fifth entry into the series. I rate this six out of 10 franchise entries because I view the Ash vs. Evil Dead television series as an entry, which would make this the sixth. Yeah, I, I'm going going six out of ten. I will watch it again um, just so I can rewatch some of the things that I probably missed because my neck was at an upright position trying to watch this thing so close to the screen. And I want to see if maybe I was in a pretty good mood when I went and saw it, but I want to see if maybe if I'm in a different mood, if I if I think differently, I, I will give this film another chance. But uh, as far as entries in the franchise, it is my least favorite. I even like the 2013 remake more than this, which a lot of people didn't like that. And the the 2013 was more serious, but it was just brighter. I liked the 2013 remake more than I like this film. But it doesn't matter what I think, because this thing had a $12 million budget. And as of this recording, it's already around, I think it's over $50 million now that it's grossed. I think more people like it than don't. I am coming across a lot of people who are kind of like what I just said. We're like, hey, I don't hate this thing, but, you know, it's really not the best. And let's let's see some more. So when we left the theater, the comment I made to my wife about it was that for the quality of movies, I almost feel as a series altogether, Evil Dead 
is the top of them all. They've put out, I call it five movies, and you're absolutely right with Ash vs. Evil Dead. We could call it six. They were all great movies. You know, good quality stuff. And that's saying a lot for like the lack of quality on the first couple movies, but it, it, they were still great movies. So I feel overall this series is probably tops when it comes to the whole series in general. Like, you know, I love Halloween, but it, it, it has its stinker so far. And this one, to me, doesn't really have stinkers. I, I've enjoyed them all. I'll give you this. I think I know what you're saying. And that is usually in a franchise, when you get to part six, part seven, that's when the monsters are going to space or they're, you know what I mean? And it kind of gets silly and it's just a cash grab to, to really continue things where I think that evil dead is just starting to, and that's one good thing this, this movie did serve a purpose for was expanding the mythology, expanding the universe. It's just starting to grow and go in different directions and get out from underneath Bruce, which it needed to do to be able to continue on. Um, so question for you guys, there's obviously going to be a sequel. I don't know that it takes off from the end of this one and follows that girl as a demon. I don't know that I'd like that. I don't know if she's a strong enough actress, if there's enough story there, if we need to continue that story with that book, where would you like to see it go next? Do you have a idea on where you would like it to go next? I've kind of thought about it, and I think that's where, like, my storyline for the movie, it would ma- it would be the worst one. But I would like to see her walking along the highway, get picked up by a trucker. This girl goes crazy, and they end up at, like, some truck stop or something. <laughs> and then it just, and it get, and, and I'm sure it gets super silly from there, but it's, they, they could go anyway with it. She could come across another, another group of people at an Airbnb in the cabin or, or in the woods, and we could be right back to Evil Dead 1. They, I hope they ignore that that character. I know that's kind of like logically where to go because she's possessed and now carrying it on. But I really thought that was a cheap way to end the movie. I thought I kind of felt a little cheated right there. Like you, even though I didn't enjoy a lot of things about the film, it you know had this certain thing, and then you did this like oh whoop, whoop and now we're here, you know. And I just thought it was cheap. I would like to see, um, and I think Brian, you said something like this earlier in this episode. I'd like to see. Evil Dead in the 20s. I'd like to see almost a, obviously you're not going to do a prequel. Well, I mean, we, we saw Ash or uh, Army of Darkness, so we went to Medieval Times. I'd like to see the story or something similar to what led up to that book being vaulted up. I'd like to see a period piece. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, you could also get like the story of the original book from Evil Dead with the family and the professor that found that book and took it to the cabin and what happened there. Or if there's a third book, I mean, where is that book? You know, maybe we go back and we find that book or we go to the 70s even and a a period piece, like you said, something that's giving us some more mythology about the book or the books, you know, or hell, you could go back to the origin of the books. The book started somewhere at some point and they were all, I gather, formed by the same group of people. Well, maybe you go back to that and you find out the origin of the books and the demons and the. I wonder if these are the conversations that that Marvel fans have because I am totally disconnected from the whole Mar- Marvel <laughs> universe. But there's so many, there's the different timelines and there's the different. You know, I, I wonder if this is the same conversations that they have because we're like, oh, well, you know, but the animated Ash vs Evil Dead that's now in the future would be cool, but then in the past, but then over here. This movie, do you guys think, I saw someone say this, do you guys think this, this could wind up being a new mother, or a modern at least, new Mother's Day favorite, that every year, you know, Brian Hoover asked us this as a question one time, do you watch a certain movie a certain type of year, is this a Mother's Day film? I don't know. It didn't really have to do with Mother's Day, but I guess the mother getting possessed and we are close enough to it, yeah. I don't know that most mothers will watch it on Mother's Day, but I mean, we could. <laughs> horror fans could watch it on mother's day i like the idea like going back to what you said about the 1920s you know we could have exorcist versus the evil dead and it could kind of (laughs) go along those routes with the priests going at it that's that that would be fun i'll pay for my tickets right now if you had that coming out i know one thing for a thousand percent certain the dad in this movie who we never met, he was only spoke of. Papa was a rolling stone. He dodged a fucking bullet by taking off, didn't he? <laughs> you imagine if he was still there. Oh, he's like, he's like, no, I'm not there. I'm everywhere. You know who else is everywhere? Our podcast network, the PFPN. Let's hear from them. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. 
the shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. So now that we've heard from our podcast network, we have a new segment. A date which will live in infamy. So we're starting a new segment here at the I Like a Spooky Horror Podcast. We're going to discuss things that happened in horror history in the two weeks between this episode coming out and the next episode. Um, sometimes it'll be the day the episode drops that we'll talk about. Sometimes it'll be events that happened in the two weeks leading up to the next episode. This episode, I got some news. I'll start with May 15th. On May 15th in 1981, the movie Happy Birthday to Me was released and Creep Show. Three was released in 2006. Not sure anybody's seen that. Um, also released in 1981 was The Fan. I guess that's kind of horror. What do you guys think? In 81 was The Fan? Yeah, this, well, I don't think it's The Fan that we're thinking that's, of. Okay, that's probably not, yeah. I don't know that one. I don't know if I've seen Happy Birthday to Me either. And I know I haven't seen Creep Show 3. I think I'm going to not be like Jason and believe everything I hear on the internet. I'm going to research the fan. I believe it. 1981. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, yeah. Director Ed, I can't say his last name. Writer, Bob, stars of a drama horror thriller. It's got James Gardner in it. Douglas, a record salesman, and is an obsessive fan over actress Sally. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep, 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 yep. I know what this is. It didn't come to mind, but I've, I think I've seen it before. You know the meme from Happy Birthday to me because it's like the axe going into the birthday cake. And I use it all the damn time for when somebody has a birthday. It's a good 80s horror movie. I mean, it's I enjoy it. So probably got a pretty good cult following. I'll say this with all of the, all the great movies that came out in 1981. It sounds like the spring of 1981 was probably like one of the most lackluster months or, you know, seasons in that year. Happy birthday to me is not bad. But there was a lot of great shit that came out in 81. Just not in the spring. May 17th. On May 17th in 1936, Dennis Hopper was born. And we love Dennis Hopper. I love Dennis Hopper from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. That's it. That's all I like him for. I don't care about any of his other movies. No Easy Rider. I was going to say Easy Rider, man. No, I just want to see him double chainsawing it up, fighting... Leatherface or Bubba, whatever the hell they call him in that movie. You don't like uh, Speed, the movie Speed with Keanu Reeves? Not a fan of Land of the Dead? Yeah, it's okay. No, I mean, it's no text change. I'll mask her too. <laughs> and then in 1955, Bill Paxton was born. Favorite Bill Paxton movie? Go. Twister, probably for me. Probably Near Dark for me. I haven't seen it a lot, but it's, yeah, it's it's a fun movie. Bill Paxton's role in Near Dark, I I love that character. I love how he played that character. Yeah, he's been in a ton of great films. And Twister was a great movie too, Jason. But yeah, Near Dark, I, I loved his, uh, his work in that. And you know, Bill Paxton's famous in the horror community because he's fought Alien, The Predator, and, oh, and The Terminator. Yeah, he's the only person that's appeared in Alien, Predator, and Terminator movies. Wash day. Nothing clean, huh? Nothing clean, nope. And this is the coolest one on a May 21st in 1908. The film many consider to be the first horror movie, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, premiered in Chicago. It was a silent black and white film that received positive reviews from critics. Yeah, I wasn't there. So in 1908, over 100 years ago. That's... You don't say. Was that, was that Lon Chaney? Uh, I don't know. I don't. In 1908? Ooh. Nope. Hobart Bosworth. That's interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what you thought? You thought it was Hobart Bosworth this whole time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was 16 minutes long. It was one reel. And there are no existing copies of the movie today. No known existing copies of the movie today. Oh, that's sad how that happens. Yeah, that is sad. Yeah. Maybe, they're, maybe they're buried underneath a parking lot in L.A. somewhere. Play the movie, we're all going to die. Well, let's hope they have an earthquake soon so we can get it out. There went all of our listeners in California. They're like, fuck them guys, they're wishing an earthquake on us. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Any any thoughts on any of the news? No, I like it. I like I like the segment. Just, uh, you know, kind of keeps us fresh on 
things that happened. And I mean, I guess it keeps us fresh on the old shit that happened a hundred years ago. <laughs> That's, yeah. We get new news at the beginning and old news at the end. And in between there, the record player was invented, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, uh, you You can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been, so I'm excited to see where this new segment's going to take us. You know, discussing the, the first horror movie known to man, uh, your recorded horror movie known to man, on the first time this segment came around, very cool stuff. Something I kind of want to know now, what do we got going on? got anything jason i feel like i should just record something and we'll just play it every time it's my turn to talk <laughs> i actually have something we've talked about it clint's reminded me <laughs> what i have to do got a little road trip coming up after this episode comes out uh gonna go hit the football hall of fame go back up to De the detroit area look for I've, i'm trying to find any horror locations there's not much in the midwest so we're going from Illinois to Indiana to Ohio to Michigan to Indiana to Illinois, like back to Illinois. And there's not <laughs> much big stuff around there. I've thought about extending it a little bit and headed back into Pennsylvania and taking my wife to Evans City Cemetery, which I would love to go back to that again. Maybe see some of the other stuff that there was a lot of stuff filmed around there that popped up when I did a search. Maybe I'll go find some of that stuff, but it, it is like a little, quite a bit farther to get into Pennsylvania. And I don't know if I want to commit that much more time to it. I guess we'll have to see what we're doing. I'm excited to get back up to Detroit area. Uh, Clint was just at the Screams. What was it? Scream Costumes or Screamsville? I wasn't there, um, but uh, Ted was there with, with the gumball machines. And uh, it was at Screamers Costumes. And it's uh, North Detroit, just north of Roseville. Hip off Gratiot Ave, I think it is. I would love to get up there, Weirdsville, Weirdsville Records, which you've talked about. Which isn't far from Screamers, yeah. Then I'll get over to the big house, hopefully get a little tour there, meet up with Clint at some point, hopefully. Nothing horror related. My daughter reminded me that our next convention isn't until August that we'll all be at and together, so that got me looking and makes me sad. I wish I could find something somewhat close before that, but probably nothing. If any of you listeners out there have anything that's going to be, you know, in the Midwest that maybe doesn't get a lot of love, let us know. And hopefully I can come check something else out. Just make sure you send him reminders or he'll forget. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I probably won't come anyway. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's just a big tease. You know, there is something to check out up here. It's not the biggest thing in the world, but uh, so not far from where I live over, I think in the Battle Creek area is this old schoolhouse. And I'd have to read the story and the mythology again. I don't remember exactly, but it apparently is what inspired the Jeepers Creepers film franchise. Oh, that the actual schoolhouse? Like, we're, Is that the, the unsolved mystery? Yeah, yeah, something like that. That's only about maybe an hour, maybe hour and a half tops from my house. Yeah. We, dr we drove right past Battle Creek, Brian and I did, and I'm like, oh, I think that's the home of Kellogg's. That's kind of what I knew about it, so... No, huh, that might be kind of cool to look. Unless I see some guy with a creepy-ass truck, then uh, fuck that, I'm out. So, Brian, what do you got going on, buddy? So, our trip to Michigan's not until later in the year, but we have a con in Michigan we're going to. I already booked our room and all that good stuff, so I'll definitely be there. May 13th, so the, the day before this episode drops, I will be at the Capitol Theater. We're going to go do a little dinner and date night. We're going to see John Waters' Serial Mom to celebrate Mother's Day. So the day this comes out will be Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to everybody. I hope your kids behave and that your husband doesn't drive you crazy and that you have a good day because, you know, mommy's not with the maggots now. But I mean, other than that, just editing away and hanging out at home with Finley and working, working, working. Going to go up and see my son play a lacrosse game up by Chicago. So other than that, not much horror related. There's some watch a bunch of movies, maybe open some of these records and listen to them. What about you, Clint? You got anything What's, going on? How does Jason's answer usually go? Uh, no, no, I got nothing. <laughs> no, that's legitimate. Um, I'm just busting your balls. I really have nothing going on. So uh, the time this episode comes out, yeah, I would have already finished uh, my one-day pop-up event halfway to Halloween. So I'm, I'm just, at, at when this episode comes out, I'm just kind of, I'll be getting ready for a one-day event in June at Eloise 
haunted asylum up in Detroit. They're going to have uh, CJ Graham's going to be there. And uh, I think Paul S. Taylor, who played Hellraiser, who played Pinhead in one of the later Hellraiser series. And they're doing um, escape rooms and vendors and the haunted house will be open. I'll talk more about that, though, as the time gets closer. So, yeah, I'm just kind of hanging out, man, trying to uh, relax a little bit and get caught up on the yard and save up some money. And yeah, not, not a whole lot going on. That's lame. We're all lame except for Jason. He's going somewhere. So now that you've heard us rate Evil Dead Rise, what we're up to, new news, old news, collectibles, don't forget to check out the I Like It Spooky Horror Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Check out our YouTube channel, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. He's waiting for us to laugh. I just say, what's he going to do? I got nothing. Ooh, I got it. Evil Dead Rise is full of... Gah! Gah! Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Show some fucking respect for the dead, will ya?